Hey, Merry Christmas, everybody. I recently put out a video about this meteor shattering across the sky here. And I wanted to read you guys this 1833 paper on basically describing the electric universe, which is right now kind of cutting edge research that is going away from the authorized model. These guys over at Thunderbolts Project aren't your typical YouTube hacks. They're actual scientists and physicists. And these videos aren't made for entertainment purposes like most YouTube videos are. These are actual scientific videos. And they've gone a long way towards proving what we we're seeing up above our head is not the sun being all these hydrogen molecules that somehow gathered together in a vacuum of space, but rather an electrical plasma discharge just like an arc welder. When you understand we live in an electric universe, then it's no surprise that we have all of these strange atmospheric phenomena associated with these cosmic disturbances that we go through. If you're not aware, the petroglyphs all around the world are showing us these atmospheric observances that the ancients saw. The spiral can be found around the world and they'll try to write it off as some type of symbolism, but it was literally something that they were seeing up in the sky. This is the Norway spiral from 2014, I think. That's not Photoshop. That was really up in the sky. Another ubiquitous description is the stick man with the two dots, always the two dots on the side. This has been reproduced in the lab as an actual plasma formation. And here you can see it in 3D. So this is literally what our ancestors were seeing up in the sky. Now, science calls these time frames that last 50 to 150 years, grand solar minimums, simply because the number of sunspots on the sun diminishes during these time frames. Physicists are still trying to write formulas for why this cycle happens, but it doesn't seem like a cycle at all to me. A, a cycle indicates a fixed period of time and then it starts all over and that's not the way it happens. It's not the sun acting on its own cycle, it's the sun being affected by some bigger cosmological occurrence. But since this time frame does have a name already, I will be referring to it as the Dalton Minimum. I'm going to disagree with this graph here and tell you exactly why I disagree, but it was more like 1780 to 1833 that this happened. And I'll do another video soon on this because it was my information that I put out on this a couple years ago that turned into everyone thinking that there was a reset in the early 1800s. This was small in comparison to what happened in the 14th century. There's an increase in seismic and volcanic activity during these times. And so just for brevity, I'm going to give you a very fast rundown of exactly what happened during the Dalton Minimum, starting with the 1780 Lockheed volcanic eruption, caused a volcanic winter over Europe, ultimately led to the French Revolution because there was food scarcity and starvation. Marie Antoinette supposedly saying, let them eat cake. It's because everybody was starving because of that volcano. Then around the 1812 era, basically, uh, you had Tecumseh's Comet, this comet that was up in the sky for almost a full year. During this time frame was the New Madrid earthquakes, the largest earthquakes ever recorded in North America. The Mississippi River flowed backwards. Uh, the Real Foot Lake was formed during this. During that same year, 1812, was the earthquake that destroyed the mission in San Juan Capistrano, California. The 1812 Caracas earthquake that destroyed 80% of the town. Then by 1815, you had the Mount Tambora eruption that caused another volcanic winter. Literally caused a whole year without summer. And one year without harvest wasn't enough to cause massive famine like in the the 14th century that was five years of no harvest so they call that the great famine but the one year was enough that basically everybody ate all of the livestock it caused migration and conflicts and i'm sure there was plenty of starvation but it wasn't the worst deal in history mary shelley was cooped up in a house 
during all of these lightning storms, nonstop storms that were going on. And she wrote Frankenstein, you know, the character that gets animated by lightning. But the earthquakes and the volcanoes and all of the disruptions that it caused are well known in many circles. But here's where the history books shut the book and cover this part up. It's all of the atmospheric phenomena that also happen that it reads like a science fiction book sometimes. So let's fast forward to 1833 towards the end of this cycle, a paper written by Reverend W.B. Clark in the magazine of Natural History. Meteoric phenomena have been exhibited during the last few years on a scale of unusual magnitude and more frequently than at many previous epochs. From the statements of more than 50 credible observers, it appears that the northeast part of the United States was visited by a most extraordinary display of falling and shooting stars for nine hours on the night of November 12th to 13th, 1833. Passengers aboard the Hila from Liverpool, 300 miles from the coast, observed the same occurrence. Nothing will express the remarkable appearance displayed so well as comparing it to the most brilliant exhibition of rockets and fireworks. One observer calculates that at least 207,840 meteors were seen at Boston. Uh, just an inside note here. This is known as the 1833 uh, Leonid meteor shower. That The Shawnee Indians were expecting this thing to come. They were sky watchers for many generations beforehand. So they were enjoying the light show while Westerners were thinking that it was literally the end of the world. And this isn't the only time that I have on record of this fire in the sky, end of the world kind of scenario. It happens more often than you would think. But these are nothing like the textbooks tell us. They would say that this is basically impossible. So they varied in size from that of the full moon to that of a teacup and even to a point. Some of them were followed by a train of pale or bluish and reddish light which in one particular case seemed acted upon by the wind. Phosphoric lines also marked the display. In some cases, an explosion was heard and gelatinous substances was found in three instances where balls had struck the earth. So these were striking the earth and obviously in earth's atmosphere if it, the wind was acting upon the tails and blowing the apparently glowing tails around. The height of these phenomena varied from a short distance from the surface of the earth to a considerable elevation. Where they first appeared, though, in descending through the atmosphere, they exploded in some few instances within 10 feet of the earth, and in others, they struck it. The weather, it seemed, throughout the whole extent of the region visited was suddenly changed immediately before the display from warm to cold accompanied by extraordinary transparency of the atmosphere. Calmness and frost succeeded to storms and intense heat. The wind had changed from southeast to northwest and during the display to northeast, upon which the meteors increased in brightness and number. The direction was generally to the west, but they appeared to different observers drif differently directed. They fell, says one, in every direction resembling a fall of snow. The air was excessively electric during the display. Clothes and hair were visibly affected. affected. The declination of the compass needle is also on good authority supposed to have increased, so magnetic north was not showing magnetic north during this. The aurora borealis preceded, accompanied, and succeeded the meteors as seen in different localities. All the observers seemed to agree in one fact, that the radiant point was in the constellation of Leo, and said that if the magnetic needle were allowed to move both vertically and horizontally, that it would point towards the direction that these meteors were coming from. Now, here's the concurrent phenomena that happened the exact same time as all this was going on. The sinking down of an acre and a half of wood at Hudson, New York, a full 30 feet below the surface. So, in an acre and a half of woods sunk down 30 feet into a sinkhole. They discovered this after 
quote, the trembling of the earth previously observed there. So an earthquake and the ground sunk in. Now, unfortunately, this is the internet and sensationalism and clickbait and everything. And so it's grown to the point where every major city in the world sunk and had to be buried out of the mud. And it's just, there was not one singular event that caused destruction worldwide. There was a series of events, and I can literally go around to almost every country and tell you when these happened. And they haven't just happened once. He writes that it is also mentioned that a similar occurrence took place about 80 years since when so many falling stars appeared over the volcano of Gayambo in Quito that that mountain was supposed to be in flames. The great earthquake of Kumana in 1766 was also preceded by similar phenomena. A year before all this, in 1832, a phenomena of like character and similar display of meteors resembling the most brilliant fireworks was seen all over the south of England and in many parts of the continent. And much alarm was occasioned in this neighborhood in consequence, I'm sure. And at that time occurred the earthquake at Bermuda, the eruption of Etna, and closely afterwards that of Vesuvius. At Bronk in the Tyrol, the meteors were preceded by the appearance of an intense light in the sky, which about 6 a.m. descended from the sky and was then drawn up into a globular mass. It then extend, expanded and from it issued numerous meteoric stones. Now, I can literally go on and on for pages and pages about auroras, meteors, lights in the sky, earthquakes, volcanoes, they're all tied together. But I want to talk about the meteorites themselves and what they had to say about this back in 1828 because it, it, they never once bring up the concept of space. However, at the end of this, they do describe the electric universe very well. The views of Dr. Herman are borne out by the analysis of a meteorite which fell near Richmond in Virginia on June 4, 1828. Both microscopic and chemical examination proved it to be a composed of mineral substances well known. He goes through several and then says that the greater part of the mass is iron and protosulfuric iron. Then he says, everything examined gave reason to suppose that this stone was volcanic in nature. Then he goes on, various hypotheses have been brought forward to solve this mystery. Some have contended that meteors are independent bodies revolving like comets and occasionally brought within the Earth's atmosphere. Others, with the celebrated Halley at their head, as in Halley's Comet, considered them to be combustible vapors suddenly ignited on the verge of our atmosphere. Now, one thing that can't be ignored here is that we do have physical objects that have hit the ground from these, and most of the time, they're mainly iron. But even the black stone at Mecca is supposed to be a, a meteorite. It's supposed to be from the heavens, and it's kind of interesting that black rock, the company that owns everything in the world is very similar to, you know, the Black Stone. Mr. Olbers has them as projectiles from the moon, but he says that surely Dr. Herschel, who has brought the volcanoes of the moon within 40 miles of Hunslow, which is in England, would have seen an eruption before now if they'd be so frequent. frequent. So this Dr. Hunslow in 1840 was saying that the moon was 40 miles away from England. This one is, to me, perhaps the most interesting. He says, The opinions of Fusineri are entitled to the highest consideration. He shows that in electrical experiments and in thunderstorms, mineral substances are evaporated by the heat evolved and that portions of metal, etc., are actually carried off by the electric action and deposited upon other bodies in a state of ignition and fusion. Now, allowing this to be the case and the evidence adduced in this paper strengthens the idea we need not, I think, go beyond the earth for a solution of this enigma. The whole mass of testimony without an exception involves the notion of intense heat 
and the development of electric force. Now, to put that in English terms, everybody can understand. He is saying that an electronic ignition, ignition and fusion is what is creating the heavier materials out of gases in the upper atmosphere. And it's a lot like the official story we get that the heavier elements are made inside of the sun due to all of the intense pressure and fusion of the elements. So he's saying, no, that happens right there in thin air. Pretty interesting theory. So let's kind of wrap this one up. It'd take a lot more than one short video to truly cover this, but uh, how volcanic agents are primarily called into action, I do not profess to understand. That electricity is intimately connected with certain states of the earth and that those states or those effects do modify the variations of the atmosphere, there is no question. But whether electricity be itself a first cause of earthquakes or like magnetism, merely a secondary cause produced by volcanic action itself, reproducing, correcting, corresponding phenomena, I do not intend to move. It is sufficient for my purpose to endeavor to show that meteors are more likely to have arisen in consequence of the increased action in the interior of the earth as developed by earthquakes and volcanic emanations than from any other cause which we are acquainted. Should it ever happen that we actually ascertain every substance contained in the earth, the interior of which may be different construction to its crust, which appears to be a huge galvanic and electrical apparatus. Now this is YouTube, so I'm going to stop right there. The guy is not saying that there is some man-made electrical generator at the center of the earth. He is just talking about the electric universe and that there being an electrical galvanic apparatus at earth's center. And this guy was years ahead of his time. This was 1833. And now that some of the smart scientists are moving away from the Newtonian physics of things, there's saying the exact same thing. Hey, it's an electrical universe. There is an electrical potential between the sun and the earth. And when we're seeing the sunspot activity diminish, in turn, there's electrical disturbances that are causing the earthquakes and the volcanoes. So I guess it is possible that all of the atmospheric disturbances that we see originate within forces within the earth. Now, regardless whether that be the case or if it's rocks hurtling through space, the official story that we're given, I, I don't know. But one thing is for sure, there's all kinds of atmospheric disturbances. Uh, Aurora Borealis coming way down to where it can be seen in you know southern states of the United States, southern latitudes around the world. Comets, meteors, elves, sprites, spirals in the sky, all of these very strange occurrences happen during the times that are associated with the earthquakes and volcanoes. All of this, in turn, leaves cities destroyed, and for some reason, the internet is only interested in looking at pictures of old buildings. <laughs> so, for, for Christmas, I really wish I could give all of you guys the old YouTube back, because... It was a very great source of knowledge up until about 2018. And then they kicked all the truthers off and supplanted them with actors, basically. And now anyone looking for any alternative explanation other than the approved version uh, gets directed to people that look at pictures and can tell you the whole history of the world from photos. Never tell you any of this stuff, though. So, since I can't bring back all the creators and give that to you, all I can do is my little part with the parts of the truth that I know. Well, Merry Christmas, everybody. I'll see you on the next one.